Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't care what the devil's going to do. Now, I do have this in an otter box, uh, so you can't see it. But on the back here, right above the little apple thing we have it engraved, it says Pastor Edward Taylor, and it says given by FVC Family Christmas 12. That's, uh, we couldn't put any more than that on there. That's all it would let us put on there. But uh, so you are on here. <laughs> I'm not, but I'm not going to cut the auto box out so you can read it because that's probably where I would drop it and he had something here. Anyway, you know, we, we didn't, Janie didn't even walk around the house with it until we got the auto box. I don't know why. <laughs> of course, it didn't matter because I couldn't get my hands on it anyway. <laughs> now we, get the, we get it and all of a sudden it disappears and, I, and I'm looking for it and Shannon has it. <laughs> I'm like, you know, where's my auto box? I'm using it. She can't play with her iPad. She got an iPad mini, but it's going to be delivered in Tulsa. So she's, take, she's taking mine. What's that? What, what, what is that? Well, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will, to the 11th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be re- going up through a lot of scriptures. We're going to be t- discussing this morning overcoming hindrances to hearing from God. Amen. Overcoming hindrances to hearing from God. Glory to God. We're going to read a couple of things here. First, Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 and 20. Hallelujah. Now just, just, get, just be, kind of bear with me as I get used to this thing. <clears throat> God speaking to Israel, but he's also really he's speaking to the, to the coming church. In, in verse 19, he starts out and says, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may, listen, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my ordinances, and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. It's very interesting that God says this. He says, I, now he's talking, now listen, he said, well, he's in the Old Testament, but he's prophesying. He's talking about a day coming called the church. Are y'all here? He's in reference, he is referencing here the new birth. And he says, I'm going to take out that stony heart, and I'm going to put in a heart of flesh that they may. Hallelujah. Uh, guys, just, just for the new year, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna switch back over. Let's go ahead and just start putting scriptures back up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just make a change on the fly. Hallelujah. I like making changes on the fly. Amen. We can move from the references. Go ahead and put them up. All right. He says, I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk. Listen. Why? That they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and what? Do them. Now, some folks come along and want to tell you that all, it doesn't matter about anything else in the world. I'm under grace. It's irrelevant. Anything I do, any action I take, anything else other than just simply laying back and looking at the finished work of Jesus is irrelevant. But God himself, God the Father said that I'm going to take out a heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh, so that you can walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them, and they shall be my people, and I'll be their God. So God makes the statement that the new birth will empower. See, this is what grace does. It empowers you to keep, walk in, and do. It does not empower you to do nothing. Amen. So we got people want to see God wants to commune with us. God wants to fellowship with us. God wants to have a relationship with us that is in a place of walking, keeping, and doing. Being his people and him being our God. Can you say amen? amen? And so God looks here and says, I'm going to take out that stony heart. What's stony? The heart that's rebe- that always rebels against God. The heart that resists God. The heart, and put in a new heart that is pliable and flexible and tender towards God, his statutes, commandments, and ordinances. Having a willing heart to do what he says. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now, I know people don't want to hear that. People don't like to hear that. They want to hear, they want to hear a message that makes them feel like, whoo, it don't matter what you do, God's going to bless you. Well, it does matter what you do. I said it does matter what you do. Hallelujah. Um, G- John, Jesus says, I'm sorry, Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. 
They don't sit back and look and say, well, Jesus, I'm in the car. Jesus is doing I just, I just am along for the ride. <laughs> now, Jesus made an interesting statement one time. He said this. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He didn't say the cart's easy. He said the yoke is easy. A yoke is a farming implement that yokes or tandems uh, animals, a uh, beast of burden, so that they can work together. And Jesus said that coming to me, y'all, you the burden, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke, we're still burdened, we're still bound together, and walking together. Do, but he's carrying, he's carried the weight of the load. But you got to cooperate and walk with him. You got to walk in cooperation. You got to walk in harmony. You got to walk in sync with the purposes of the Lord. If he turns left, you got to turn left. If he turns right, you got to turn right. If he stops, you got to stop. If he goes forward, you got to go forward. And you got to do it at the same pace. Or Roberts preached my graduation uh, ser uh, sermon at Rama back in 1981, and he preached on tracking with God. Wonderful sermon. Powerful sermon. And he talked about, and he used the scripture that talks about the hind feet of the deer. And if you know anything about deer, you know, whenever they put their front feet down when they're running, the hind feet come up and land right in the same spot. Amen? So wherever the front feet hit and they come back and the rear feet come up and press, they land in the same spot. You track with God. You tra now, not that's walking, but running. When they're running, you know, we're tracking with God. And he treats on how, we, how, we're to, how we're to run in harmony with God. See, God wants us to walk in harmony with him. God wants us to walk in, in step, in sync step with him. Can you say amen? God does not want you, you know, uh, being the hind feet and the, feet, the front feet are landing and the very rear feet are going dragging, dragging. Well, I don't have to do anything. He's doing all the work. No, it doesn't work that way. Let me say this. If you want to hear from God, you've got to walk with God. Amen. Amen. Uh, Jeremiah 33 says, 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, or great and hidden things, that thou knowest not. Call unto me, and, and, and I will listen. And God says, so we have a promise. God says, call me, and I will answer thee. But I'm, I've talked to people who've been called not getting answers. There are reasons. You can hinder hearing what God's saying. Now, let me say this. God's talking. Are you here? God is talking. God is talking to you. God is speaking to you. God is wanting to get through to you. Everybody say Amen. amen. But he's not going to override stuff just because you've been honorary. Hello. I have three, three hindrances to hearing from God. And I'm just going to give you the hindrances real quick, and then we'll go back and own them. The first one's carnality. Second one's disobedience. And the third one is discouragement. If you're carnal, disobedient, or discouraged, it's hard to hear from God. Hello. Which one, which one you want to jump in on first? Carnality. I knew that's what you wanted. I knew it. Praise God. You were just wanting to hear that carnality thing. Amen? Woo! Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, we want to talk about being carnal. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> well, let's run over, if you will, to Genesis. Now, we're not going to read a bunch of scriptures here. but we're, Now, Genesis, write this, write this reference down. Genesis 13, 24 through Genesis 16, 30. I'm sorry. Yeah. Genesis 16, 30. So the 13th chapter of Genesis, verse 24 through the 16th chapter, verse 30. It is the story of Samson. Now, if you read this, you know, everybody thinks the whole thing with Samson and Delilah. It, you know, Samson just had a flesh problem. Delilah was number three in these chapters. Now, there may be some more we just didn't get recorded. But see, Samson was supposed to marry. What did God want? Now, if you go back and study the Bible, God didn't want Israel uh, cross-marrying. Now, we've used that a lot of times to say that whites and blacks or uh, different races shouldn't marry. It, was not it wasn't as much the ethn ethnicity of it as it was the, the religion or the, uh, the, the, the Judaism side of it or the serving God. Because, you know, people could convert, could come into Israel and convert to Judaism. Okay? They could convert and become a Jew. They may not have been a natural born Jew, but they became Jews. 
So a lot of the law about not marrying from other, uh, other, other peoples or other tribes or other nations was primarily because of what they, what they believed. You would, you would mess up. Now, I know a lot of people have preached over the years, you shouldn't mix the bloods and all that kind of stuff. I, you know, you, you get in some, we all the same blood. There ain't honky blood and black blood. Hello? Blood is blood. I mean, if you got O and you're black and got O and you're white, you can transfuse. Amen. Are y'all here? Thank you for your enthusiasm. The very people who use race to, as a, as a, to try to use race as a car are the very people who use it to, to manipulate people. All right, enough said there. I'm going to stop right there while I'm ahead. So Samson was not supposed to be run off after Philistine women. Now, when you know you're not supposed to do something and you go do something, how are you going to hear what God has to say? <clears throat> now, I'm not going to read it all, but you, you got the reference there. I'm just going to kind of pair it because there's so many chapters, it's just too hard to go in there and try to pull it all out. But let's just go this way. Samson, in chapter 16, around verse 24, sees a woman down in the Philistines, and he wants her for a wife. He goes to his parents and says, I want her for a wife. And they say, Why don't you, shouldn't, don't you think you should choose someone from our people? And he said, well, I think she's beautiful. And he, take, he goes and has her for a wife. Then he leaves her. Comes back later, and the dad's going to give her away to somebody else. Well, I thought you didn't want her. Well, that didn't go over good. So he goes, and, Bible says, and he went, went into a harlot and knew her. Number two. Then later on, I mean, after that didn't go over that great. So he comes back, he finds Delilah. And so he, he just can't, he, he can't get it. Stay with your people. Stay, you know, not stay with your people because of the right color. Stay with your people because of the right believing system. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Stay with your people because it's the right believing system. But he has to have Delilah. This is the third woman in the Philistine camp he's gone after. Hey, you're out. That was strike three. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't know if God's had the three strikes in your policy, but that sure looked like it. Don't get uptight. Are y'all with me? And so, then what happens is, Samson starts, you know, he, he has this whole thing with Delilah going on. And then the Philistines come and say, look, find out what a secret to his strength is. Because he's killed a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. I mean, he's killed a lion. He's done all kinds of stuff. And they're, they're kind of tired of him being around. Because he's caused a lot of trouble there. All right. And uh, she starts, and he starts mocking her because he starts telling her, well, if you buy me with the strongest ropes, it'll take my strength away. And that doesn't where he rises. And the Philistines are upon him, and he kills him. And, you know, and all, this, all this keeps happening over and over and over. Finally, he gives in. Here's the problem. You walk down the path with the devil long enough. You walk the ditch bank long enough. So, see, it didn't happen the first time, did it? It didn't happen the second time that she, he, she came to him. We don't know how many times, and all really, we just have a record of a certain number, but we don't know how many times she kept pestering him to get that information. Y'all hear you going home? But finally, he gave in. See, when you walk in accordance with the devil long enough, or you walk along that path long enough, you'll begin to think that what God said doesn't matter. That God wasn't really telling the truth. Easy discussion with the serpent in the garden is an example of that. Now, the first thing she should, now here's the first thing that should happen. When the serpent showed up and started talking to Adam, should have said, I rebuke thee as the authority in the earth on the, by thy belly. You'll go all the days of your life and you'll eat dust. Boom! In the story. That's what should have happened. But no, they stood there and they had a conversation with the devil. And he said, hath God said, hath God said that thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of the true, of, uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And he said, he said, we shan't, shall not eat of it nor touch it lest we die. God never said don't touch it. As a matter of fact, we know this, they were told to keep and to dress the garden. They were supposed to keep it pruned and all that kind of stuff. They just weren't supposed to eat of it. And then the serpent comes back and says, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, you'll become as gods. Now, he said you'll die. The devil says you'll become as gods, knowing both good and evil. And then Eve fell for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Ate it, engaged her husband with her, and he did eat. You don't have discussions with the devil. You don't try to walk as close as you can to the world and still serve God. Hello? 
You don't try to get away with as much as you can get away with and still get the blessing. Now, all this time that, he, that, that, that um, Samson is doing what he's doing, he still had his strength, his supernatural strength because of his hair. And each step away, although he still, and see, he thought because he still had the strength, it's all okay. There's always, you're always, whenever you're doing that, you're on a journey. You're on a journey to calamity. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end, it didn't say the journey thereof, it said the end thereof is death. That word death in Hebrew really means destruction. There is a way that seemeth right to a man. Well, hadn't God already addressed that? My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. For as my ways and my thoughts are higher than yours, are, so uh, are higher than yours. They're higher than the than the. Uh, oh gosh, Isaiah. 55. 55. Go over there. I'm, I'm not there, and I didn't have that in my notes. I just I, that's on that's a winging it here. Amen. How high are they? Isaiah 55. He said, my ways are not your ways. Now, listen, God's already addressed this. Huh? 55, 8, come on, pop it up. All right. All right. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways saith your ways. Verse 9. For as the, for this, the I couldn't get that, that first line there. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, then, then, then they come back over later and say, there is a way that seemeth a right to a man, I think Proverbs, but the end thereof is destruction. Now let me say this. We got people preaching stuff right now that seemeth right to a man. But the end thereof is destruction. I said the end thereof is destruction. It doesn't matter what you do with your flesh. That's just, that is, that's been around since Bible days when they were writing the Bible. Hello? The Gnostics ran around. Are you here? There, you don't have a real body. There's no such, the, body, the physical realm is not really real. It's all spiritual. Jesus really didn't even come in the flesh. He was a spiritual manifestation, yada, 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 yada. John wrote 1 John and, and said, that which we've seen, that which we've handled, that's what we, that which we've touched and tasted of the word of life. In other words, he's real. He was physically here. He was bodily here. He bodily died. He bodily was resurrected. Hello? Uh, 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 forwarding or preaching in opposition to the Gnostic view that only the spirit is the real world. We have our own spiritual realm now called own spiritualists or, or Gnostics. Are they called Christian scientists? They don't believe that material is real. Yeah. They don't believe it's real. Let me get a baseball bat and hit you upside the head. See how real that is. <laughs> oh, that really didn't hit me in the head. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> If you hit you hard enough, now watch out because if we do that, then, then the uh, anti-baseball bat lobby is going to come out against you and want to take all baseball bats away. <laughs> but then we have the, the uh, National Club Association that will come out and fight them. Instead of the NRA, we got the NCI. I'm just messing now. <laughs> The Gnostics believe the only spirit was real. See, and I'm going to tell you, some of the things that are being preached today are Gnostic in basis of philosophy. That it doesn't matter what you do with your flesh because your spirit and the spirit realm is the real realm and that is where you really have to you know, understand God's already done all this work and all this stuff and so your flesh doesn't matter. Yet, we find here over and over again that God does care. Yes. Well, that's Old Testament. Yeah, but my, my Bible says this in Hebrews. These things about Israel were written for our in samples or examples. Why is that in the Bible? Because there is an example to teach us an, a lesson. You walk according to the flesh and you walk there long enough, you're going to end up in destruction. Now, the first time Samson told Delilah, tie me up with ropes, and, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, and he got up, broke all the ropes and went out and killed a bunch of people, all this kind of stuff. Here, see, I can hang out with a Philistine woman. This is my third Philistine woman. I even slept with a harlot one night. Man, they took my first wife, gave her to somebody else, so I just went and found me a, 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 a hoe. That's modern-day word for harlot. 
or as I said, uh, well, Lady of the Evening, Lady of the remember, remember when uh, Larry the Cable Guy did the redo of uh, the Night Before Christmas, uh, Night Before non, the nom- what a non-traditional winter holiday, non-denominational winter holiday. <laughs> it was all PC language. <laughs> anyway, forget it. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, and then the next time she does something, she keeps telling her stuff. Finally, he went down that road so far, he began to trust that it didn't matter what he did, he was going to keep his power. He said, cut my hair and I'll lose my strength. She got him drunk, fell asleep, woke up, cut it, his hair was cut. She said, the Philistines are upon him, he got him, he couldn't do anything. So they took him and they chained him to a millstone and he just pushed that, you know, up until that day. Remember the day that he asked God, his hair had grown back out. And he asked God to restore his strength. He repented. It, <laughs> there's another story. He had to repent yeah. of his sin to be restored to his place. Christ. And he killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. Hello? But what got him there? He had heard, he knew what God said. He knew what he was supposed to do, but his carnality drove him down a path that brought destruction and misery to his life. His eyes were poked out, he was blinded, mocked, laughed at, spit upon, and at one time he was the glory of the nation. But because he's car- because he yielded to his flesh, and listen, would not do what he already knew to do. I'm telling you, carnality is your flesh overriding your spirit in any arena, whether it's sexual, whether it's eating. The Bible tells you to be temperate in all things, and all you ever do is you you, you always go out to eat at the all you can eat buffet every time you go out to eat. Hello. You know, the Bible says this, if you're a glutton, put a knife to your throat. I'm under grace. I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah. Come on now. Look over, if you will, into uh, Romans, the eighth chapter. So Samson, his carnal, his carnal appetites and his yielding to carnality kept him from hearing God and, ru- and brought him into a life of destruction and misery. You cannot hear from God clearly walking in carnality. Everybody say, help me, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, I know. You see, people want to go to church and have somebody say, hey, we're under grace. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're running around with all the women you can run around with. It just don't matter. You're going to be blessed. And that's not the biblical pattern. Carnality brings you into destruction and hinders you hearing the voice of God. Just grunt. Romans 8, 4. The righteousness of the... Uh, that the uh, well, we can read the whole thing. We'll just start with... That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh, that's carnal, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. How can you hear from God when all you're doing is carnal thinking? To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. For they, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You could not walk in carnality and expect God to hear what God's talk, telling you. Listen, I'm talking about any kind of carnality. Hello? You walk with a bitter, bitter spirit. You walk in anger and resentment. That's a carnal mind. You walk in resistance to the voice of God. He's already told you. Man, I, I like to say this. If you won't do what God's already told you in his word, how, are you, how do you expect to do what he tells you if he gives you a supernatural revelation? The Lord showed me I'm supposed to do this and that, and you won't even do what he's already written in his word. Yeah. I've had people come and give me all kind of grandiose of things God's told them, and I know in their own life they're not walking. In the, I mean, just simple thing like walking in love. How do you expect God to give you some great vision plan for your life, and you won't even forgive and walk in love? Well, God picks it. No, he doesn't. I'm telling you what God keeps doing. God keeps bringing you back to where you're supposed to be until you deal with something. He's not going to graduate you to the fourth grade until you pass third. Now, I know our public schools do that, but God doesn't. 
Hello. Well, I don't believe that. Well, I'm sorry. What did God, <coughs> what did Jesus tell people? If you bring your gift to the altar and you have all against your brother, leave your gift, go make it right, and then come back and offer it. I'm not interested in your gifts until you're doing what I've already told you to do. Hello? Well, I don't like that. Well, I know my own heart. Let me tell you something, honey. Your own heart should reflect in your own flesh. Now put those, dart, those Nerf darts down. We're not shooting me today. Amen? Are you here? If it's in your heart, it should be in your flesh. In other words, your actions should be a declaration of what's taking place in your heart. What's that old saying? Your walk, let me see, your talk walks, but your talk I mean, walks much further than your walk talks. That's the old saying. What were they, let's see, um, I can't hear what you're saying because of what you're doing. Hello? You may say I've done this or that, but your actions say otherwise. And God expects us. Remember he said he's going to take out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh that we may keep his ordinances, I mean keep his statutes, walk in his statutes, keep his ordinances, and do them. Now speaking of the new birth. So therefore, as a believer, don't come to me and tell me that God showed you this and God showed you that and God told you this if you're not doing what he's already said in the written word. Hello? How do you expect God to give you some great plan and show you how you're going to do this and do that and how you're going to be doing all this kind of stuff and you won't even do the, the, the simple things? He's already said, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's just talking about the written ones. We always want a revelation. We always want to hear something big. I'm going to tell you, honey, you ain't going to hear nothing big until you're doing what's already been given. And you're, you say, that's carnal to think he will. The carnal mind's enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. And Bible even says this, neither indeed can it be subject. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians. Did I read all that? <laughs> Yeah, I did. <clears throat> Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3. Y'all enjoying this, aren't you? Pastor, I want one of them feel-good sermons this morning. I've, I've eaten too much over Christmas. That's why you're in here. Colonel! I'm just messing. I probably ate too much for Christmas. But I, I was pretty good this year. I didn't do like I've done in the past. I was much better this year. Hallelujah. I only ate a little bit too much for Christmas. Then I had to repent. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now stop. Here is the preacher of grace, the apostle to the church, Paul the Great, writing to the church, calls them brethren, and says, I could not write to you as spiritual people because you're carnal. He called born-again believers carnal. He didn't say, I am writing unto you who are under grace. It doesn't matter what you're doing with your flesh. I'm writing unto you because I should be writing to you as spiritual people, but you are carnal. You are carnal. Are you here? I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto, listen, you were not able to bear it. Neither yet are ye now able, for ye are yet carnal. Now stop. Paul's saying, I'm wanting to write things to you by the Spirit of this, write things to you by the Spirit of God, but I can't because you're carnal. Carnality inhibits your ability to receive from God. And people are waiting to hear great directions and great things and wonderful visions and have prophecies given over them. Yea, my son, thou art called of God to travel the world and to go over all the waters and to win multiplied billions to Jesus. You alone will be the greatest evangelist in the history of the world. All nine gifts of the Spirit will manifest themselves in you. And you'll walk in all the fruit of the Spirit. And you'll be the forerunner to the return of Jesus Christ because you're great. And you don't even pay your tithes. Woo. 
Hello? Carnality does not walk in harmony with God. Now, we go a lot of places with carnality. We're just not going to have to do it. You can figure it out. If it's fleshly, it's carnal. I'm not talking about, listen, there are things we, we, you have to eat. You just don't have to eat five meals at the same time. Hello? We all like a good soft drink, maybe. You don't have to drink a two liter at a time. Y'all hear you going home. We won't even talk about sex. I don't need to say it. This church knows that. I've preached enough about it in the past year to make people, oh my God, we're Victorian Puritans. No? <laughs> Hello? We need to understand that carnality is an inhibitor. And Paul wrote to a church and said, I mean, listen, if you go back and read the first chapter, he said this, you come behind and no gift. They flowed in the gifts of the Spirit. See, you think because you've done spiritual things or have flowed in the gifts of the Spirit, God's blessing what you're doing. Uh-uh. God used a donkey before. God's used a chicken before. That means you, you're qualified. Hello? Jesus said if the people didn't cry out, Hosanna to him, the rocks and stones would cry out. And you know, when the first, I guess that was the first Rolling Stones concert. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm going, oh my God. He'd give him two weeks off, but he still comes back with that corny stuff. Oh, well. <laughs> Paul said, even though he said you come, come behind and no gift, he gets over in chapter 3 and says, I couldn't write to you as spiritual people. You're carnal. And he goes on and says, and says um, are you not carnal? For where among you is envy and strife and divisions? Are you not carnal? And walk as men. Well, the, the Amplified Bible says mere unchanged men. Your carnality makes you act like, think like, and do like a mere unchanged man. But what did God say back over in Ezekiel? I'll take out the heart of stone, and I'll put in a heart of flesh. What for? He was going to put it in there. He was going to put it in there. <laughs> there you go. That they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them. They'll be my people, and I'll be their God. God doesn't want you carnal. God wants you spirit ruled. God wants you spirit dominated. Well, if we just preach that we're the, who the new creation man is, we'll walk in that. Hogwash. Paul didn't. You look read Paul's writings. He did talk about who we were in Christ. He also talked about what not to do with your flesh. He even told people I had to buffet it every day. Carnality will hurt you. Amen. What's our remedy? <clears throat> What's our remedy? Look in Colossians chapter 3. Hallelujah. This, this, just the carnality. Listen, I'm gonna, each point I'm going to make, I'm going to have a remedy for, your, for that particular thing. For carnality, Colossians chapter 3. Looking in verse 2. We're going to read verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Glory to God. Looking down in verse 9. Let lie not one to another, seeing, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, uh, bond nor free, but, all, but Christ is, is all and in all. Put on therefore... As the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Well, we could spend a month there. Above all these things, put on agape, love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to that which you're called in one body, and be you thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another <coughs> in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then verse 17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So, he tells us to put on, in other words, 
put on something, set our focus somewhere else. Forgiveness requires a change of focus. What do you mean? It has to forget about what somebody did to you to forgive them. You can't walk into a room with somebody and can't be in their presence because you're so mad your blood pressure about blows the top of your head off. You haven't forgiven. You have not forgiven. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. He says here that as Christ forgave you, you forgive. I go to the Lord and his tact don't blow when I show up because of things I used to do. Aren't you glad? He's not mad about the times before I was saved that I used his name in vain. He don't go. He, he doesn't sit there and say, well, if, you, if, you, if you've repented, you'll do the such, such, and such, and such, and such, and such. Are you here? He, he, he's forgiven me. He's not, his blood pressure doesn't uh, go up 400 points when I show up. He has forgiven me. And the, he said here in Colossians that we are to, <coughs> even as Christ forgave the church, we're to forgive. We're to put on the bowels of, of mercies and kindness. Amen. We're to act like Jesus. Did you know in interpersonal relationships, there's going to be problems? <laughs> there is. You're going to be having a bad day. I'm going to be having a bad day. And we're going to cross paths on the bad day. And one of us is going to tick one of the other off. At some point in time in history. It's going to happen. But we are to forgive even as our Father in heaven has forgiven. Amen? Glory to God. As a matter of fact, he says forgive. In, in the Lord's Prayer, he said forgive us as we forgive our, 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 forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others their trespasses against us. Now, well, that was the Lord's Prayer. It's an Old Testament prayer. Yeah, but the principle is the same. If you think you can expect God to forgive you every time you come and you won't do the same thing, it don't work that way. This is an area the church is going to have to grow up in. Hello? Well, I'll just run over to the other church. That don't fix the problem. You can walk into the, you know, it's like getting rid of your wife. Let me tell you a problem. Here's the problem with you getting rid of your wife and getting another one. You're involved. Hello? Whatever the problems were that you, you had there, if you don't fix them, you're taking them with you over there. Yeah. Hello? You, just, you, think, you think your grass is greener. You know, everything that you see is based on the perspective of where you're standing. Hello? I, I remember that, that, how many of you saw the Jungle Book? You know, and Mowgli at the very end of the movie see the girl for the first time. And, and uh, Baloo goes, uh, stay away from them. They ain't nothing but trouble. Now, his point is this. They're all the same. If you think you got, if you got marital problems now, and the best thing for you to just run on down the road and get you another one, you haven't learned to deal with the interpersonal relationships. I know there are certain situations, and we, we don't want to get into that. I don't like to get into that because then people always say, I'm that situation. And they hadn't even tried to work out anything. But people do the same thing with churches. They'll, they'll get to a place or something's going on, they'll just think they go somewhere else and have a honeymoon, but honey, the honeymoon will end. Hello? It's like Pastor Hagen used to say. He said the man married the woman because she could uh, enhance his ministry because she could play the piano and sing. And, 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 and of course, she wasn't anything to look at, but she could play the piano and sing will help his ministry. And about two weeks after the honeymoon, they're sitting at the table, and he's got the morning paper up, and he lowered it down, looked across at her, and he said, Sing, woman, sing! <laughs> now, it's probably, we probably have a woman story, but Sister Lynette would have to tell that, and I didn't get hear her. So anyway... He married her and then found out there's something got to be done about this because, well, we had a friend who told his wife, he said, put your, make, put your face on. He'd wake up in the morning and say, go put your face on. They're not married anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and if he tells the second one the same thing, it had the same, had the same result. Yeah. <laughs> go put your face on. Now I'm going to go put my blinders on so I don't have to look at you. That went over big. <laughs> 
All women always get the short end of that stick, don't they? <laughs> no, he says here, he says here that to set our affections on things above and not on the earth. Now, let me say this. Those affections can also include your pride and your ego. Because there are a lot of people who are more concerned about their pride and their ego than they are the kingdom of God. They're embarrassed. They're humiliated. Get your affections off of you. Because he says this in the next verse, For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Your ego and your, your uh, pride have nothing to do with walking out with God. Amen? You need to kill it and keep it crucified. Can you say amen to that? <clears throat> Look at Ephesians 4.24. He says here, well, we better back up in verse 22. Better back up in verse 21. 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. This is the truth in Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, old English for lifestyle or manner of life. The old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore put away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members <coughs> one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let six years go by, don't let the sun one day. And neither give place to the devil. Let me tell you, you start walking out of love and start walking in unforgiveness and you won't hear from God. You'll hear something. The Bible says there are many. First Corinthians, remember when Paul starts talking about tongues and the purpose of tongues in the church. And one of the things he says is there are many voices in the earth and none of them without signification. The devil will come talk to you. The devil will call you my son. The devil will tell you how wonderful you are, how spiritual you are, and how great you are because you do this and you do that. And the devil will pump your ego up and then tell you all kinds of stuff. And you'll be telling people, the Lord showed me and the Lord told me and God said. All the time, it's not God because you can't hear from God because you're carnal and you're not spiritual because you won't even do what he's already told you to do. And you deceive yourself into believing that everything's okay with God because you're still breaking the ropes. The Philistines are falling upon you and you still got money in the bank. Go ahead and shoot me. Everything's okay. But let me tell you something. Keep walking down that path and you're going to wake up one day and this, here's, here's, what, here's what the interesting thing here. You go back and look at it. And there in, in, in um, where we're talking about Samson. Judges. It says this. He wished not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. His strength had departed from him. He woke up and did not even know it was gone. He was so carnal and so inebriated with his carnality that she said the exact same thing she had always said. The Philistines are upon thee. And he rose up and wished not that his strength had departed from him. He did not know God had left. So I'll say, wow. wow. Say that backwards. <coughs> wow. Say it upside down. Mom. All right. It's a joke. Anyway, think about this, this. This is written as an example to us. There are people struggling to hear from God. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. <clears throat> we know from the scriptures, God said, I'm going to take out that stony heart, put it in a heart of flesh. You're going to walk in my statutes. You're going to keep my commandments. You're going to do them. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. His desire to commune with humanity. And you can wake up one day and not even know you can't hear his voice. You don't know the difference between him and the devil.
And then somebody comes along with a stupid message. It says it doesn't matter what you do. God's going to bless you anyhow. And you run to it like a, like a, a dog after a bone. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We, Maddie is a wonderful pet. And she sits at Janie's feet every meal. Plate to mouth. Plate to mouth. Plate to mouth. <laughs> waiting for the crumb to come down. The girls come home. She sits by Janie. No food? Shannon. <laughs> Why? Because Shannon goes. <laughs> crumb. <laughs> Loyalty's out the door. <laughs> it's whoever will give the crumb is where the dog goes. It doesn't matter. I mean, a, a guest can come in and start putting crumbs down there and she'll run over there. Carnality can't distinguish the voice of God from the voice of the enemy because all it wants is to be told it's okay. As a matter of fact, it gets to the point where it rejects the voice of God and the Word of God as authority because it constricts their flesh. Yet they think God's going to speak to them about big things, about direction, about life, and about this and about that. And they won't stop and do what the Bible's already said to do. Carnality is an inhibitor. It is destructive. That's why we're told to put off the old man and put on the new. That's why we're told to put on certain things and make sure other things are not operating. And then we get lists in the Bible of things. The works of the flesh are these. Hello? And we got a list of them. And people look at that and go, but I'm under grace. That's what I think about that statement. Because if it's a work of the flesh, I don't care what you're under, it's still a work of the flesh. And you got to deal with it. And you got to do like Paul and buffet, not buffet your body, but buffet your body daily. Keep it under. Hello? You got to keep it under. The remedy here then becomes living a life where you're putting off the old and, keep, and putting on the new. Keeping the, uh, keeping the flesh in control. Keeping it under. Telling it, no, you're not going to act that way. Hello? I got rights. You're dead, and your life is hid in Christ. You ain't got rights. Well, my rights and privileges are in Christ. Yeah, those privileges and rights, but you don't have the right to walk in unforgiveness. You don't have the right to walk out of love. You don't have the right to make decisions based on your flesh. Now, I, listen, I know you can get up and leave here and go find you a church. This tells you how lovely you are and how wonderful you are and not preach anything that you don't want to hear. And, uh, and in five years from now, you're going to be further backwards than you are right now. Because there's things you've got to deal with if you want to hear from God and go forward. There are things you need to yield to and submit to and obey if you want to go forward and not backwards. And my responsibility as your pastor is to let you know that if you want to go forward, you're going to have to do certain things to enable you to go forward. And you can't keep living according to your flesh and expect God to speak to you and give you directions. But a false spirit, an antichrist spirit, will come and whisper in your ear. The Bible says that God will shorten the days in the end so that the very elect themselves won't be deceived. <laughs> that Satan can appear as an angel of light. And if you're carnal, you won't know the difference. I've been in churches where ministers came in, and I knew by my, sp my spirit they weren't out of God. And everybody around was all oohing and aahing and talking about how wonderful they were. And they were all just mystified and, and, and drunk in the presence of their deception. Why? Because they're carnal. They were looking for a manifestation. Now give me a big offering. What do you need an offering for? We're just bringing the gold dust back. Hello? We got gold dust manifestation. 
and churches just giving tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of dollars to a ministry because they manifest gold dust. And my, my whole question is, why do we need to give them money? They can, just get, they can manufacture their own, their own operation expenses. Just manifest some gold dust and go trade it in. As a matter of fact, you ought to be given to the church. You ought to leave a deposit in the church when you leave. Everybody's rich because you can make gold dust. But something on the inside of those who hear from, who are walking in the spirit go, something's not right about that. There was a minister about 20 years ago came out and everybody, in the, everybody on the planet just about thought he was the greatest thing since peanut butter and sliced bread. Day one. And I, and I tell you, I used to tell my wife, this bugs me. It bugs me because it just grates on my spirit. But why is it every time something like that is going on, I kind of go, eh, something's not right about that. And I feel like an idiot because everybody's just talking about how wonderful they are. And they're all having them in the churches. And they're taking up big offerings. Come out and find out he was a homosexual. <laughs> Hello? Carnality. See, we got to be spiritually sensitive. Do you want to be spiritually sensitive or not? Hello? Look at Romans 13, 12. If we're going to, if we're going to walk with God, we've got to walk in spiritual sensitivity. We've got to walk in spiritual maturity. We've got to grow up. Hallelujah. <laughs> The night is far spent, Romans 13, 12. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision to the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. God is calling the church out of carnality because he wants to talk to you. He wants to be able to speak to you and say, go do this. And you're not going off and doing stuff and only hearing that which, was, which is good for you. <coughs> are you here? There are people, every time God speaks, it's always to their advantage and somebody else's disadvantage. That's not God. One of the writers in the Bible said, I will not give that which costs me nothing. Paul said, I'm willing to spend and be spent for the gospel's sake. That is spirituality. Come on, church. See, we, we kind of got this prosperity mindset that everything we're always going to have rich. We're never going to have to sacrifice. We're never going to have to submit. Everything's just always going to be hunk of door. We're going to have millions and millions of dollars, and we'll fund the gospel a little bit on the side while we float around the Pacific in our yacht. But though he were rich, he became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. Spirituality is willing to spend and be spent for the gospel's sake. Carnality is what's in it for me. How can I be in charge? How can I be the big dog? How can I be the top dog? How can I have control? How can I always do something that's always going to work to my advantage? God may spend you to help somebody else's advantage. And it may look, now listen, he that lends to the poor, the Lord will repay. But you may be in a season where it costs you to do something, or apparently costs, but we got a mindset, it never costs us. We never have to submit. We never have to sacrifice. That's, a carnal, that's as carnal as you can get. I said that is as carnal as you can get. We never expose ourselves to the possibility of failure to obey God. I'm not talking about just pastors and churches. I'm talking about people. But we want to hear God tell us how, who, where to go invest and get a get million dollars. Or God showed me how to run this and get a million dollars. And God showed me how to you know, sell this product and get a million dollars. How about God told you to go? Get, I had a guy come to us one time. Come to us. And he had all the money in his bank account. And he said, God said, go empty your bank account, give it to the church, and start with nothing. And it was $8,000. Next thing we heard is old Robert's going to school and doing well and stuff. But you know what? God, he said, God said, empty out my bank account. Give it to the church and start with nothing. 
we got a lot of people who say, well, I need for somebody to put $8,000 in my bank account. Oh, I know. I, but look, I understand what's like to have be tight. But, I, you know, I'm trying to get you to understand. Spirituality and carnality don't think the same way. Carnal mind's always about what's in it for me. What's best for me? What supplies me? What makes me look good? What makes me feel good? What puts me here? And you want to hear from God? Oh, and we'll do things that look like they're spiritual to people. But it's only a mask to our carnality. I have a word to say right now. Selah. There are a lot of people who do a lot of things to look spiritual, and all they're trying to do is hide their carnality. As long as they can control it, as long as they're in charge of it, as long as they're ruling it, and they're never opening themselves up for the possibility that God's going to require more of them than they're willing to give, and He always does. If you find a place in your life where you're not willing to go past, you found your demarcation zone of carnality. Because until you're willing to go past that, you're controlled by your flesh. I, I, I want to close. About 25 years ago, 26 years ago, 27 years ago, how old are you? 27 years ago, 28 years ago. Janie and I were asked by a good for Pastor Zabowski's brother to go to Mexico um, with him and spearhead a, move, a, a plant by his denomination to start inner city churches in Mexico City, Mexico. Projecting at that time in 1980, 82, 83, that by the year 2000, Mexico City would be a city of 25 million people. Now, it didn't reach it, but that was, that was the projections of it. It's one of the most polluted cities in the world because it's, it's on an inactive volcano. It's in a hole. And all the pollution stays there. Hello? And, um, and we agreed to go. But one of the things we had to do in order to go was pack up and fly to London, England for two months. Nine weeks exactly. And go to their world mission school in London, England. Well, now my wife at the time did not like to fly. She didn't want to take a ship either. She was not interested in going to Europe. Were you? Mm -mm. And, uh, and of course, you know, you got to start thinking about it. You got to raise enough money to live in England for two months. I mean, it was not, you know, it was, well, can, can we just kind of bypass that? We want to go to Mexico. But, but, you know, we can drive to Mexico. Nope. And uh, we, we, met with, we met with the head of world missions at a, at a meeting down in South Carolina to discuss this because, you know, uh, uh, Dave wanted us to meet him. We had to meet him and him interview us and talk to us about us going and being part of this team and stuff. And, um, and so we met with him and we said, now look, we, we just, we, look, we really do this. We just really don't want to go to, we don't want to go to London. You've got to go to London. Now, whatever reasons, fear, whatever. I mean, whatever you want to call it. The fact was, we didn't want to have to go to London for two months. We just wanted to go serve God in Mexico City. Got to go. So we, we self-decided and talk. And my, my wife said, I'll go. Let me say something. There are going to be times you, you, you say, God, I will, when on the inside of you, you just don't want to. But you have to make yourself become willing. I'm telling you the next week, we've been struggling with this thing for two or three months, trying to raise money, money wasn't coming in, trying to get out of going to London, couldn't do that. I'm sitting in prayer and God goes, okay, you don't have to go now, I just wanted to know if you will, we would. So I went and told my, my pastor's wife had been screaming at him, they're not supposed to go, they're not supposed to go, they're not supposed to go. Now, as soon as we got made the, 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 the change of attitude and heart and said, yes, we would do this and we'll do whatever is required, God said, I never wanted you to go. I just wanted you to be willing to go. We could hear, you, can hear, you cannot hear from God while you're in disobedience. But when you commit and submit and yield, he can speak. And he spoke. Amen.
and it wasn't another less than about two years we were here. Are you supposed to be here? You don't have 5,000 people. You don't have 800 people. I don't, you know, listen. If that's all you can think about, I love you. There's other places you can go listen and watch television. We're obeying God. Why haven't you left Greensboro? Because he told me to come and didn't tell me to leave. Have you ever asked him? Oh, yeah. But you know what I found out? The only time I ask him is when there's trouble. When everything's good, when the church is growing, when finances are flowing in, and you're able to do everything God has on your heart, you just don't go, Lord, am I supposed to leave? And I have found out during that he never tells me to leave. I keep getting more vision about what to do. It's only when things are tough that you start thinking about leaving. That's carnal. That's carnal. Hello? When it ain't going your way. Anybody have, have stuff? Is it really this late? Since we're not having service tonight, can I get another 30 minutes? Who'll give me 30? 30, an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Oh, I got two hours. By then, all the, all the other churches will be out of the restaurants and you'll just get to walk right in and get food. Amen. Are y'all here? You're going home. Hallelujah. Love my little thing, but it loves it. It'll clock out on me. I'll get, I'll overcome that eventually. Amen. Amen. All right. You have to submit, obey, yield to God in order to walk in his plans and hear his voice. Amen. Let us put on the armor of God. Let us walk honestly in the day. Not in riot and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Put on Jesus Christ and make not provision to the flesh. Why? To fulfill the lust thereof. God does not want you fulfilling the lust of your flesh. He wants to be able to talk to you. He wants to be able to commune with you. He wants to be able to have fellowship with you. He wants, to be able, he wants to be in harmony with you. But you've got to be in harmony with him. Because here's the deal. He cannot walk in sin. He is pure, just, holy, and righteous. You have to go walk with him. And he's made the provision whereby you can. But you still got to go there.